I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. We're speaking with Blake today. Blake, how you doing, my friend? Doing great, Will. How are you? I'm good. I'm off work, so it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good thing. <laughs> well, Tom, Brian, I, I don't know which one of you guys talked to Blake, um, but I'll let you guys kind of grab the microphone and run with the ball. Yeah. I uh, So Blake and I chatted, um, well, was it yesterday, Blake, or the day before? I think the day, the day before. before. Day before. And <clears throat> Blake is, uh, uh, he was cooking barbecue ribs. And so, yes, I was. They were fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and you had a lot of activity. So <clears throat> I'm just going to hand the uh, the mic to you and, and kind of fill us in on the stuff that you've been running into. Okay. Um, well, the... I've seen, uh, for sure, three of them. Um, my first encounter was in McNabb, Arkansas, which is probably, I don't know, maybe maybe an hour and a half away from me right now. <clears throat> and it was, uh, I'm not sure, 2000, 2000 uh I don't know, 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. Tom, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, dates are pretty hard to recollect for me. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, I mean, that's that's close enough. That's that's good. Well, anyway, uh, I, it was uh, the day of my birthday, the day that I actually saw it. <clears throat> I was deer hunting that morning, and actually the first time I'd ever hunted by myself. I was a young, young, young kid back then. Um, but anyway... I uh, shot at a doe that morning and made a clean miss. My dad came down there and we looked for it, didn't find any blood. And came back to the house, I'd say about, I don't know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, somewhere around in there. And I told my dad, I said, you know what? I'm going to grab my single shot 20 gauge and I'm going to go walk down that creek bed and see if I can kill some squirrels. So I loaded up my vest, was squirrel shot, and proceeded to walk down this dry creek bed and I'd probably been walking maybe an hour or so and kind of lost all sense of direction of where I was going and I came to a spot in the in the creek where the, the canopy up overhead was it got real thick where it kind of blocked out the uh the sun you know it's kind of real dark in there and I got to a point and I, I was watching the trees overhead and I thought I'd seen a squirrel jump a tree and if you squirrel hunter, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, so I thought I saw this squirrel jump a tree. So I, at this point, I'm about 10 yards away from where I'd seen the tree move. So I ease up to it, and I'm standing up underneath it. And I, I don't see a squirrel, but about 10 seconds goes by, and I, I start hearing something on my right-hand side. And the uh, the creek bed that I was in, uh, the, the sides of it were about five and a half, four foot tall, somewhere around in there. And I was standing in the middle of it. Well, this noise I was hearing on my right hand side was, it was real faint, but it was, it was, it was there. And I stood there and listened and, you know, I, it, it kind of sounded similar to a squirrel bouncing in the leaves, but it sounded real, like I said, faint. And, uh, I stood there for what seemed like forever, but eventually it started sounding a lot heavier and the closer it got the more it sounded like a it sounded like a man it sounded like he was dropping center blocks and leaves every time it took a step and it got closer and closer and at this point i'm thinking you know maybe i'm on someone else's land uh did i walk too far is you know another deer hunter gonna walk up on me or another squirrel hunter i, I had no idea well, this rocked on for 
what seemed like forever and eventually the sound was you know it was right there and i was fully expecting to see a a, a blaze orange hat top the, the crest of this creek bank but i didn't what i saw was a uh was a what i can only call as a bigfoot i mean it it topped the uh the crest and I could see from what I would guess from about the, the belly button region down or region up, I'm sorry. And it was cold that morning. <clears throat> and when he topped the when he topped the, the crest of it, he was looking left and right. And at that point I don't even think he knew I was there. And of course I was being quiet. And he uh like I said he was looking left and right and every time he would turn his head he wouldn't, I'm sorry, he wouldn't turn his head, he turned his torso. And when he did that, I could see the uh, the muscles underneath the hair, which wasn't as long as I, I would think. It was kind of short, actually. And you could see the muscles, you know, flex every time he turned his, his torso. And every time he, he would do so, the, uh, the steam, you could see it coming out of his nostrils. And he, uh, he did this for... I think two or three times and I'm not sure if I, I crunched a leaf or I, I snapped a twig or what, what really happened, but I made some, some type of noise. And he, as soon as I did it, he locked right into me and, uh, stared me down, stared a hole through me. And at that point, I kind of, I kind of blacked out a little bit. I'm not really sure if it was the, uh, the fear aspect of it that took hold of me or, or what, but, I took off running <clears throat> and I ran probably about halfway back home and I stopped to catch my breath because I, I was going to, I was about to pass out. I was so scared and running so hard. And when I stopped, I could hear him on my left hand side, which would be the side of the creek bank he was on. And he was booking it. He was moving. He was making sure he knew or, you know, knew where I was and knew that I heard him. And I, you know, I, I picked up the pace and I ran back all the way home and I uh, pretty much blew a hole through the door trying to get through it and locked the door behind me and I'm, I was I was almost in tears and um, I I told me and my dad talked about it afterwards a couple of years later and he he eventually told me that there was a lot of stuff going on in that that part of the uh, that lower hand side of the state told me a couple of stories about things he had seen around there and I broke down and told him what happened to me. And, you know, we kind of, uh, swapped stories a little bit and I finally came to terms with what I saw, you know, was real. Cause for, for a long time, you kind of try to push it out of your mind, but eventually you just got to accept it. But that was, uh, that was my first one. That was the first one I saw. Hey Blake, was that, uh, was that in Arkansas or is, is that Louisiana? <clears throat> yeah, that was in uh, South Arkansas. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that was uh, that was right down the road from Falk, actually. Oh, okay, interesting. <clears throat> um, wow. And now you and I talked the other day, and I th- you did say, you said your dad has also encountered has other anybody else that you know of. I guess I'm trying to find out is there any history or. Uh, oh yeah, you know. yeah. There, there was, there's a lot of history in in that area. Um, my great grandma actually lived two houses down in the same same vicinity of woods where I saw that one. And my dad ended up telling me that that she had seen a little one looking in her uh, bedroom window one night, or kitchen window or bedroom window. I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, and it was snowing. And they actually saw the tracks where it walked up to the to the window and then turned around and walked off. And that was probably maybe 300 yards away from the house that I was staying in when I saw this first one. Hey, hey Blake, um, in your estimation, did you think that that first one that you saw was um, a juvenile or a fully grown adult? I don't, I don't think it was a fully grown adult. I think it was... Uh, I don't want to say teenager because I don't want to give them that much credit, but um, I'd say in between, in between, it was, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a giant, 
you know, so to speak. But it was, it was, uh, the physical features were very prominent. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, I mean, it was very robust. I mean, it, I think I told Tom the other night, it looked like a three quarter inch sheet of plywood. <laughs> <laughs> it was huge. But, you know, at the same time, um, the, the upper limbs being the arms weren't as big as you would expect for that big of a torso. It was, it was, the proportions were so off. It was, it was hard to, I don't know how to say that. It was, it was hard to, to soak in. And it's still hard to soak in at this point. But, and you're the, talking the about, <clears throat> Go ahead. so you mean like the, well, I was just going to ask you, say the proportions are not what you expected. Do you mean like uh, elongated arms or? Um, right, right. And, you know, um, you think when you when you see something like that, you think more of like a you try to put it into a realm of perspective, I guess you could say, and you try to compare it to, you know, maybe a grown man. But it, it's it's very far away from that. I mean, it's it's really hard to explain. I mean, I, I don't know if, if you all have seen one or I know Will has, but it's just it's hard to, to wrap your mind around, so to speak, you know. Right, right. Um and just one last question that I had uh, was, do you remember what color uh, the hair was? Solid black. Okay. Well, that sounds, Will, that sounds like uh, pretty typical for juveniles, isn't it? They're, yeah, that's that's pretty in line for a younger one. Yeah, and, I, you know, I've, I've heard that so many times since then. I've, I've actually got a couple of friends of mine that uh, that are into this, too, and, not by not by choice, but um, <clears throat> they they say the same thing. And, and of course, I've I've listened to Will and his shows since you know, golly, it seems like forever. But and you know, I've I've paid attention to everything Will said because it matches up with everything and I've I've experienced and I've encountered and I've researched and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us about your second experience? Because I'm very curious to see what you thought about the the physical comparisons between um, the next one that you saw compared to the, the first one. Well, um, <clears throat> the next one that I saw was actually in Louisiana. Um, probably about 45 minutes away from at where I'm at now. Um, it was in a... How I say that without giving it away. It's in a national forest, not very far away from me. Mm-hmm. And my cousin actually owns 20 acres of private property inside the national forest, which is very good for deer hunting. And I was, I'm trying to remember the year. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, we were getting ready for the upcoming deer season, which around here starts in, well, gun season starts late October. Both season starts early October. But anyway, we, we had two big box stands, and we were getting ready, like I said, for the upcoming deer season, putting out deer corn and, and saw licks and trimming limbs and getting you know every, all the stands cleaned out. Well, I got off work one afternoon and <clears throat> drove up to this property, and I got the two dogs at the house. One was a beagle, one was a uh, Catahoula Cur mix. And the beagle was mine. The Catahoula was my cousin's. And I grabbed my 45 and stuck it on my hip and loaded them up in the truck. And we drove down to the deer stand and I let them out. And we're, I'm trimming limbs through there and, you know, checking shooting lanes and so on and so forth. And um, to add into this story, in front of the stand was a pretty much like a a berry farm. We had muscadines, um, blackberry bushes, uh, some other fruit trees that I'm not familiar with. I'm, I'm sure if I'd asked, I, I'd know. But anyway, uh, the deer had plenty of food right there in front of the stand. I mean, the corn was kind of pointless, but <laughs> it eased my mind a little bit. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, so I let the dogs out of the truck and I'm about 10 yards away from the stand closest to the creek 
and I'm trimming limbs going through there looking back at the stand and I'm looking in the woods seeing where the deer lanes are and uh <clears throat> I guess about I don't know 20 minutes goes by and I'm steadily trimming limbs all the way to the creek and I just happened to look off in the woods and it was pretty open it, I mean it wasn't like a like a flat open but you know it was you could see pretty good for about 50 60 yards and so I look in there and I see this stump that I'd never noticed before. And of course I'd been all over those woods at this point and I didn't really pay any attention to it. And I kept on doing what I was doing and I, I kept getting this feeling like I was being watched and I'm sure all of you have felt the same thing. And, uh, I don't know, another minute or so goes by and I'm, I look back at the dogs and they're not acting any different. They're playing around, you know, and, I go back to doing what I'm doing and I get to that same spot and I look back in the woods and I see this stump. Well, I started focusing on the stump and it seemed like this stump had two big eyeballs right in the center of it. And at that point, my my hair on the back of my neck stood up and I'm just locked in on this thing and I'm watching. And for some reason, something told me to look back and and check on the dogs. Well, I turned my head, I look back and it was gone. And at that point, I grabbed both the dogs and threw them in the truck, and I drove back up to the house. And my cousin got there about, I don't know, maybe an hour later. <clears throat> and I was telling him about it. And he was like, well, do you want to go down there and, and look around? I said, no, not really. I don't. <laughs> I don't care how big the guns we got. I'm not going back down there today. So I uh, went to work the next morning, and it bothered me the whole day. And I finally came back that afternoon, and I mustered up the courage to go down there and as i uh walked into the woods the stump was gone obviously and i didn't know it but um the creek ran at a straight and then turned at like a 45 right there where the, this thing was and the ground right there was bare it was just broken up dirt and you could see where it looked like he had laid down and had his head sticking up just above the creek, the bank of the creek, and was and I as I looked back, I could see where I was standing. It was just a clear shot. If I'd have been standing there, you saw me clear as day. And in the bottom of the creek, it had a little water flow in there, not much, maybe a couple of inches. But there was one big impression right in the center of it, where it looked like it slid off the edge of the creek bank, put one foot in the middle of that thing, and jumped all the way up on to the other side of the bank and so i climbed the other side of the bank and i looked and on that other side it was nothing but small pines and you know if, if there's a bunch of pine needles on the ground you're not going to make a lot of noise running through there and i'm sure it knew that by that point but but yeah it it jumped from the gravel in that creek bed at least four and a half feet up into that pine thicket and was gone. And I never even heard it. Never heard a sound. And, and was, was my... oh, I was just going to ask, and, and was this one the same color? Was it jet black as well as the first one? No, I, actually this wasn't. Um, it was more of a, how do I say that? Are you familiar with Spanish moss? No, not offhand. On cypress trees? Um, so like kind it's like of like a light, it's like a light gray color. Oh, okay, okay. But it had like a it was a light gray kind of mixed with a little bit of black, but it it wasn't solid gray. You know what I mean? Right. But it was you could it was you could pick it out. I mean, if it was you know in the middle of a green pine thicket, you could see it. But from where I was standing, when it you know topped the the other side of the creek bank, it. It'd have been it's so thick back in there you would have never seen it take off. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it had a it had a gray grayish blackish tint to it. It was it's hard to explain. But the closest thing I can I can get to it would be Spanish moss off the of cypress tree. And and actually another question too, not just with this one but also the first one. Did they have um, cone shaped heads? Did you see? <clears throat> the second one did definitely. The first one that I saw didn't. It had kind of a more blocky head. And, well, I, I say blocky. It's, it's 
I think I, I told – how did I describe it? It looked like a bowling ball, kind of, because it didn't have a neck, you know. Okay. But the second one, I'm not sure if it had a neck or not because I was – I was I wasn't very far away from it, but I was far enough away where I couldn't really make out distinct features. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, the first one looked the head looked more like a bowling uh, bowling ball, and the second one had a cone shaped head, definitely. You know that second one, Blake. So he must have been absolutely perfectly still watching you. <clears throat> for oh, yeah. you, to, you know, to to think it was a stump. Yeah, I've heard that before. Will, have you heard that where these things are just absolute like statue like? Yes, um, on occasion, sure. Especially, um, yeah, it depends what they're doing, of course. But um, you know, if you were to happen to catch one, you know, hunting or doing whatever they're doing, um, they, they were going to probably stand still just to see what you're doing, see if you're going to leave. You know, so they can continue. It's kind of hard telling. You really have to know what they're doing in the area. But, uh, yeah, occasionally, sure, they'll stand completely still. And, and well, just to kind of add to that, too, <clears throat> I presume that uh, the farther that you're away, the more likely they are to be still. Because if you're at a further distance and they're trying not to be seen, they're probably aware that if you're looking in that direction and you see movement, then you know that something's there. But if they're, like, dead still, then they could easily be confused for, you know, something else, like even a tree or a, or a stump in this case. Yeah, being, you know, being the same posture as us, you know, in trees, coincidentally, uh, if you stand still and with the dark coloring, you could easily be overlooked. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. that seems like a real good strategy for these things. And, I, you know, it makes you wonder uh, how many times uh, people have walked right by one of these things and never even knew. It could have been, you know, maybe 20, 30 yards away and you wouldn't know it. Well, it could be many times, sure. Yeah. Well, um, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, <clears throat> and... And why don't you tell us about the, the third one that you saw, and how did well, that? Well, um, uh, actually, there was there was some other stuff that happened in between the second one and third one because the the second and third encounters weren't very far apart. They were actually pretty close. Um, the third one I saw was actually on the same property, but <clears throat> there's some other things that happened to me um, that I came to know later was you know. That's that's what they do, but here's what here's what happened. Probably, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe a month after this second encounter happened, um, it was cold. Um, it was late one night, and I slept in the bed that was closest to the tree line where I'd seen that second one, and the window faced that tree line also, and. This house was old. It was built in the 1800s. Very nice house, though. Very well built. Um, so I'm laying there in bed one night, and it's probably midnight or 1 o'clock. And the moon was real bright, and we had these uh, the curtains over the window. But the moon was so bright, the tree outside was casting a set shadow on the uh, windowsill. So I'm laying there in bed, and I couldn't sleep, and... I just rolled over and I was laying there thinking about everything and all of a sudden I, I heard this, uh, this scratching noise sounded like and it sounded like it was right out, right outside the window on the outside of the house and I laid there and I thought maybe, you know, maybe a raccoon was moving around out there or something else but uh, about 10 minutes or so goes by this and it was, it was off and on in intervals and I uh, I laid there and just listened, and uh, probably about, I don't know, 10 minutes goes by, and I heard what sounded like a, uh, sounded like a cat, but it was like a, a low guttural sound, and it, was, it sounded like it was trying to imitate a cat, and at this point, I'm, as soon as I heard it, I was completely terrified, because earlier that day, I'd been walking around the house 
playing with the cat and I was making a, you know, a meow sound. And as soon as I heard it, it clicked in my head and I was like, Oh my God, this is really happening. And it did it for God. It seemed like, I don't know, 30 minutes. And it was just, like I said, off and on in intervals. And I laid there and listened to it for, for God, it felt like forever. And, uh, it was just that that was a, a really really strange thing to to hear and so the next morning you know this rocked on to probably three in the morning but anyway the next morning I, I get up and I walked outside and right outside the front door we had a uh, a dog food trough it was it was built like a little tin can box had a lid on it and when it was full of food it weighed probably 20 pounds and as soon as I opened up the door, this dog food box was sitting in the middle of the yard with a lid open. And it looked like somebody had took two big hands and stuck in there and scooped out dog food sitting in the middle of the yard. Oh. And somebody, somebody uh, tried to tell me that it was a, a raccoon or something, picked it up and moved it. And I said, no, a raccoon would have knocked it over and it would have been all over the yard. You know, Blake, I, I, I don't, don't uh, disturb you here, but I wanted to break in real quick. I have a, f- some photos from a lady in, I want to say Oklahoma, hope I got that correct, who had a very similar kind of a thing happen. She had some, um, what looked like five-gallon buckets with the lids sealed on them. And there was uh, food garbage in them uh, sitting outside of her house. And one day these buckets were taken you know, quite a ways out into the yard. The lids removed. That weren't just sitting there; they were sealed. Uh, the contents apparently eaten, and you can see big finger marks on each side of the inside of the uh, the buckets. So that's a very similar kind of thing I've seen before. Wow! But yeah, um, <clears throat> and the the really weird thing about it is we had a there was a live oak tree out in the front yard, big, big, giant live oak tree, <clears throat> and. Uh, we looked, of course, all around that driveway was sand. Almost all the way up to the porch was sand. But there was a little patch of of, uh, of uh, bahia grass that was real thick right in the front of the, of the porch. And we looked for tracks forever, or I did. Um, of course, I didn't. I didn't really want to tell anybody else what I thought it was, but I was I was pretty confident I knew what it was. But I looked for tracks forever and never found the first track. And the only thing I can think of is that thing snuck around the edge of the house where there was grass and didn't step in that sand because the, the dog food was sitting in the grass where the, you know, in the canister or the container. And it just, it blew my mind of how smart they had to have been to do that. Ooh. But man, it was, that, that was, that was very, very strange. You know, from going from the the noises the night before, and then waking up to that, that was that was weird. Yeah, but, now, Blake, now are are you are you aware of the? Because um, I'm sure you said that you listened to Will before. Um, are you aware of the that there's four types of these creatures? Have, um, you, heard, have you heard that before? Uh. I don't believe I'm familiar with that. Okay, just because I, I I know know that you said that these last encounters that you had were in a different location. I mean, not not too probably not too far away from from Arkans from the Southern Arkansas incident. And the the four types can can really pop up anywhere in the country. Um, so they're not necessarily confined to uh, to one specific area, but in general. We do find, or we do hear about, um, <clears throat> certain parts of the country having, like, predominantly one type, than uh, other part of the country that has that has sightings of uh, the other type. So it kind of just makes me wonder because you said that the first one and the second one looked different. If they were actually two different types of these. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I took. I, I I didn't get you for a second, but I got you now. Uh, yeah, I I do agree with that. There definitely are different types. Um and the uh I'm not sure what is classified as the first type that I saw. I, I it's I don't know it offhand, but 
um, yeah, they were two different um, looking creatures, definitely. And yes, I agree with that. There's um, very uh, different variations in them sometimes. And sometimes they'll be, well, I'm not going to go into that, but yeah, I agree with you. They're definitely. Yeah. And, and especially when you talked about the two different colors. Um, and also you said that the first one had like kind of a bowling ball shaped head, whereas the uh, the next one had more of a cone shaped head. So, so we'll j- just to, if you want to jump in here real quick, do you, uh, which type do you think that that Blake is referring to in his description of, of the first one and also the, the next one? Well, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, typically in the southern part of the country, it's, it's the type twos that are in that region. Uh, the other thing to remember is there's going to be variation within a species. So, uh, might not necessarily be a different type from the, from one sighting to the next. They might just be very different variations. Just like the right with people, you know? Yeah. And that goes to head shape and all kinds of things. Yeah. Hey, now, Blake, here's another question, too, because you said that somebody that you talked to, when you were hearing that those cat-like sounds and the scratching and everything, and I think you said that one of the, the neighbors oh, said, hey, it might, it might be just a raccoon or something. Um, did anybody else in that area, um, not that particular person, but anybody else, did you ever hear of any other activity in that area? Uh, actually, yeah, I did. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> I was actually this this uh this story happened before I even saw the second one. Um, I was at a feed store uh, probably about a month before that second one that I saw. And I was standing there buying. I was looking at corn and uh, salt licks, and this old man walked up next to me, and we were talking back and forth and. He was like, well, i got to give me a salt lick. And I said, you deer eating all of it? He said, no, not the deer. He said, the bears are getting to it. And I said, the bears? Of course, in this part of the country, I mean, bears are rare. And uh, I said, was it a black bear? He said, yeah, I think so. And, of course, in my mind, I'm automatically <laughs> going to, to Bigfoot. And that's the first thing I think about. Somebody said something like that. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, he proceeded to tell me that he had a he had a couple of trail cam pictures of uh, what he said it was a bear that picked up this salt lick and moved it out from in front of the camera. And of course, I I didn't get to see the pictures. He wouldn't show them to me, which raises my eyebrows a little bit. Um, yeah. And he said he, he said he yeah, had that's quite picture. the bear. Yeah, I, I would say so because them salt licks are about five pounds a piece or more. But uh, he said he had another picture. <laughs> Not even a circus a, bear. <laughs> no. <laughs> but he uh, said he had another picture of what he said it looked like the back of one uh, smashing it. I'm not sure if it was on a rock or what because, like I said, I didn't see the pictures. And I, this is just secondhand knowledge. I'm not 100% sure on it, but. It raised, like I said, it raised my eyebrows a little bit when I when he told me about it. Yeah, well, you know, one one thought I I just had as well is that uh, you you said that your dad knew of activity in these area in in that uh, area in Arkansas, and one of the one of the typical things that we can probably assume is that the gentleman that you're just referring to, uh, we're talking about the bear. When you're kind of a stranger to somebody. Sometimes they know more than what they're really saying, and they, they're more reluctant to talk about it to someone that they don't know that well. But in the case of, uh, you know, your, your father, um, and I think he, you, you said that he talked about uh, your grandmother as well having these experiences. It seems like people are more likely to come out and, and admit that <laughs> they have more knowledge than, uh, than people might think about that. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I totally agree with that because – um, I'm not sure how it is up north. I've, I've never crossed the Mason-Dixon line, if you ask me. But um, down here, a lot of people don't they don't stick their nose in other people's business. And if you uh, if you ask the wrong questions, you'll you know you'll find out real quick, you know that it's it's a bad situation. So 
when it comes to something like this, especially this topic, which is a touchy subject to begin with, um, you just gotta, you gotta kind of, I don't, you gotta kind of ease into it. You gotta know somebody before you go running your mouth. That's definite for sure. Cause I've made that mistake before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, that was a, uh, that was strange. And, you know, like I said, I, I repeatedly asked him, I was like, Hey man, if, if, will you send me those pictures? And I gave him my phone number and everything. And he said, well, if I, if I think about it, I'll send them to you. And he, he never did, but, mm-hmm. and that was only about uh, probably five miles away from where I saw that second one and third one. Yeah. Sounds like you're a little bit suspicious that it's the same thing. Oh yeah. I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident yeah. that's what it was. Sure. Well, given the proximity, uh, yeah, more likely. Say that again, Will. You broke say, it. I was going to say, given given the proximity, and it was around the same time period, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very likely then. And, you know, some people are real finicky about pictures. Um, like you said, if they if they don't trust people too much, especially this subject. Uh, you know, I've had people, I, I've got a picture that was sent to me and, and the family that took it wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. In fact, they didn't send it to me. It was a family friend of theirs that sent it to me. So, you know, it's a pictures are a funny thing. Well, and I, I, I totally agree with that. Cause I've, I've got several pictures of, uh, of tracks on my phone that I've, that I've taken over the years. And I had a, I had a guy show them to. He said, "Well, there's a boot print right, be- right before it." I said, "Yeah, that was mine. I almost stepped in it." He was like, "Well, it's not real because there's a footprint right there." I said, "That well, <laughs> I almost walked in it. So yeah, there's going to be a footprint right there." And you know, I. And that's another story. Um, well, let me ask you something. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me that uh, a bigfoot will walk in a straight line. Is that true? Uh, well, here's the difference. I, I think, I think some people are mixing this up when they, when they walk and you see a line of tracks, um, the tracks aren't towed out like ours are there. You know and I wouldn't say pigeon toed there, but the toes are, the feet look almost straight ahead of one another. Uh, now mm-hmm. when they walk around, Oftentimes, they'll when you find lines of tracks, they're a meand- they meander all over the place. They're not really in just a straight line. Yeah. So that's that's the two that's the two differences, and, and I think a lot of people mix that up. And and will right. remember your your uh, your first sort of introduction to the subject when you found the tracks on the uh, the railroad. Um, they were kind of all over the place, right? Yeah, they were all over the place. And I've seen other lines of tracks. Um, my brother-in-law, in fact, found some tracks um, back in 2005 in an area not far from where we all grew up. And uh, I counted over 100 tracks. It was a small area. I mean, most of it was surrounded by really thick grass and brush, so it wasn't conducive to prints. But in the area where we did find the prints, there were over 100 of them, and they, they meandered back and forth kind of aimlessly. And yeah. I've seen that and heard that many times over the years. Yeah, and that's an indication too that they're, in most cases, they're not solitary creatures. Uh, so usually, when you find, like, in a lot of cases, when you find tracks, you're not just looking at one, one individual, but but probably several. Well, you don't know that unless you get different different uh, print sizes. Yeah, but, but but the behavior of meandering—that's kind of a—it's an odd one to think about because they, it's, you think, well, they're going from point A to point B, but it's not really what they're doing when they're in a place. Mm-hmm. Well, um, do you think that is for uh, concealment, Will? Uh, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> this particular line of tracks I was telling you about um, in 2005 was in an open area, uh, surrounded by trees, so. Um, it, for whatever it was doing, it was just kind of wandering back and forth and around and looping, and uh, it was it was actually very difficult to count the tracks because of that behavior. But I've heard of that many times in other locations. Sometimes that you will yeah. find a straight line, you know, they're going from point A to point B through an area, but a lot of times it's this meandering behavior. 
Well, um, I can shed a little bit of light on that from from what I've seen and what I've found and what I've been told. Um, yes, they do meander around a lot, and I've actually, I, like I was telling you a minute ago about that picture of that track that I'm showing that guy, and he told me it was it wasn't real. Well, what I didn't tell him was probably four and a half feet away from that. At almost a 90-degree angle, there was another track that was not as definitive as the one I took a picture of. And <clears throat> that line of tracks went from, from like you were saying, Will, it just bobbed and weaved around these trees and into the water a little bit and eased out. And it was it was strange. And, of course, I didn't take any pictures of those because they looked like a, looked like you took a, a rubber boot and just smashed it down in the in the mud, you know. And, you know, it could be that they're in search mode when they're doing that. Maybe they're, you know, looking for things to eat. I mean, that's most of their behavior. Yeah. And, you know, they're driven by food. And I, a lot of people don't think about this, but I feel like they're driven more by food and water than anything. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And social, the social group that they have, you know, that they're attached to. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And I had a guy tell me not too long ago that he researches up in, uh, on the uh, Sabine River on uh, North Toledo Bend, right in that little area in that WMA. He told me that, you know, every time he's around them, they're right there next to the river or, uh, you know, maybe a mile out and they'll move back in. They're never, they're never that far away from water because they're not going to travel no 46 miles to get the water they're just not going to do it mm-hmm. but uh <clears throat> let's see there's something else I was going to tell you about crack I don't know what it was uh Will let me ask you something since I got you here sure um when you have, have you ever seen them walk on all fours I like, haven't you no. know physically watch them no I, I haven't right. personally so, seen them walk on all fours but I've talked to quite a few people that have. Well, <clears throat> I, I don't want to say I saw it walk on the floors. The third one I saw was kind of in between. It was kind of um, from two feet down to, to maybe one arm and maybe two arms at, at some point. But it was it was in the, that in-between point, kind of like he was, you know, fixing to get ready to run and didn't do it and he kind of jumped up a little bit. It was, it's hard to explain unless you watch it, but. Yeah, and um, and Blake, uh, yeah, th- th- this subject has co- has come up before too, and and kind of going back to Tom's previous question, sometimes it could be for concealment. I mean, pr- possibly the lower you are to the ground, the less likely maybe something is to, to spot you, perhaps. Right, and I, I totally agree with that. It's just like a lot of researchers or so-called researchers nowadays they. They don't look up in the trees at all. They look on the ground because they're expecting something to be on the ground. But little do they know, they, they climb trees too. And I've, I've, I found that out firsthand. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, it's the same aspect of it. Yeah. Now, when you say you found out firsthand, tell us tell us a little bit about that, if, if you don't mind. Well, the, uh, the third one um, was a, I don't want to say a very small one, but I'd say maybe four and a half to five feet tall at the most. <clears throat> Not a very big one. Real skinny. I actually kind of built like me. I'm a skinny guy. But uh, I was sitting on the porch in the same spot, the same house, same property of the second one that I saw. And I played guitar, and I was sitting out there playing guitar, and it was kind of drizzling rain a little bit. And uh, I'm sitting there, and the dogs kept acting real funny because they always sit right there by my feet when I was outside. And right in front of the house was the driveway and then once you hit the dirt road of course it went for a, a quarter mile or a mile in either direction before you hit blacktop and it was just solid woods in between them and uh there was a real thin strip of, of uh timber on the edge of the dirt road closest to the house and i was you know sitting there picking along on the guitar and i looked I looked down and I saw my dog was looking at the, the driveway. So automatically I look up and I saw what looked like a, uh, it almost is the best I can describe. It looked like a little chimpanzee. And 
It went from the biggest pine tree in the line of trees to the, I guess you can call it the second biggest pine tree, and it, it grabbed it and just hung on to it. And when I say hang on, I mean like with two arms, and I could see them wrapped around this tree. And <clears throat> it it would ease its head out one way and stick it back in real fast. It almost looked like a, uh, I don't want to say, we, the closest I can describe it would be a crackhead when they, you know, they ease out and move back in, ease out and move back in. He would do this uh, two or three times on either side. And I'm in, I'm, I'm only like 60, 70 yards away from this at this point. And the dogs would not get up and go over there for nothing. They were looking right at it. And, uh, so I sat there and I watched and I eased the guitar down on, on the, uh, on the carport there. And, and I just, I eased over to grab my phone and I was fixing to record it. And as soon as I moved my hand to reach for my phone, it jumped and I, it, it's almost like they, it's hard to explain. They, it's kind of like when you crouch down to jump, like jump over a creek or something. That's kind of how they, they, they catapult themselves a little bit. Mm-hmm. And when he, when it did it, it jumped and in midair, it grabbed another tree and swung around and jumped again. And it, it, it blew my mind that I was sitting there watching this and it just, it eased down on on one arm on all fours except it had the other arm up i think and it took a couple leaps and it was it was booking it by this point and And it's looking at you while it was doing some of this stuff right it knew you were there it's watching you wow Mm -hmm. did the dogs uh perhaps chase after it or did they just stay put I know they stayed put. As a matter of fact, the dog that I had right there by my foot, which was my dog, he turned around and walked over to the other side of the carport and lay down in his bed. Wow. And uh, like I said, it it took off and it went into that same block of woods where I saw the uh, the second one. So I'm 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 pretty confident there was a, a I don't want to say a large group, but I'm sure there was. I'm sure there was four to six of them at least around that area because we had so much food and of course we were in a national forest and we had the private property right there. So the deer flocked there during the you know, gun season and deer, deer season in general, because they know they're not going to get shot because it was probably, yeah. I don't know, five years ago that we shot a deer out there. And when did this happen with the, uh, with this little big uh, or It was uh, I'm trying to guess. It was probably um, maybe maybe three months after I saw that second one. Oh, okay. Dude, this was this was like oh God. I'm trying to remember to be exact. Uh, probably. Well, that's all right. I mean, I I didn't need you to pin it down exactly. I'm just curious if this is a recent event. So this is a little while ago. Right. And did you get any other activity after that? And I don't just mean sightings, but I mean, like, did you ever hear um, any screams or find any prints after this? Oh, yeah. Yes, I did. Um, right after this, uh, the, the following summer, we were out there, and I'd, I'd since moved away from there, and um, i moved back to where I live now. And uh, I went back out there for a weekend, just to uh, visit with everyone. And it, it ended up just being me and my cousin there. And we were the only people there. And we, uh, he was building his shop down there in the, in one of the pastures. And we drove, I drove my truck and he drove his truck. And we just drove down in the pasture and lit a small fire. And we were talking back and forth. And I was, you know, talking about work and, and deer hunting and bass fishing and so on and so forth. And come about, I don't know, maybe 12, one o'clock. And uh, everything got real quiet, and I, I mentioned to him, I said, you know, it, it's a little quiet out here. I mean, you didn't even hear any crickets. We were in the middle of a field, and, of course, we were surrounded by woods, thick woods. And, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three minutes goes by, and, and we heard a scream, and, you know, I mentioned before I play guitar, and I've been around a lot of, a lot of kick drums and a lot of bass drums, and... 
when this thing screamed, it was probably only about a hundred yards away from us inside of the woods, inside the thicket. And I could, me and him both could feel it in our chest. It was almost like it rattled you a little bit, but, you know, not, not physically, but I mean, it, it, it felt like it just resonated. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we jumped back in a truck and ran back up the house and locked all the doors, grabbed all the guns and we stayed up the whole night. <laughs> and that's when he, uh, that's when he finally believed everything I was telling him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have another question too. Uh, not just with, with this sighting, but with, with all of the activity that you've encountered, uh, what time of day were, were these t- at, uh, were they mostly during the night or, well, no, um, the, the first one that I ever saw was probably, I don't know, between nine and between 9 a.m. in the morning and 10:30 to 11 o'clock. And then the second one was probably well after 4 p.m. because I didn't get off till four o'clock in them days. But, and the third one was probably midday around 12 to one o'clock. Okay, so in other words, it wasn't dark out, so you got a pretty good look at at all of these creatures. Oh well, right. Well, the the first one yeah, I, I forgot to mention beforehand. Um, the first one I actually didn't even see his face. I mean, it was I don't want to say it was it was covered with uh, it had a bunch of leaves and stuff up up in the head region, and if I remember correctly, it had a like a. I don't know, like a bunch of pine needles stuck around his legs and stuff, almost like it had been laying down a bunch of pine needles. And the head, it, it looked like, it's it's kind of hard to explain. It's like you take a mop and you turn it upside down and you cut about halfway up in the middle of it. And you got strands on the left, strands on the right, and an opening kind of in the middle, but there's still a couple strands hanging in the middle. That's exactly what the first one looked like. And... I uh, I told I don't I'm not I'm not sure if I told Tom this the other night or not, but I you could see a nose sticking out um, underneath the hair that hung down over its face, and uh, the nose kind of looked like a look kind of looked like my nose, but if if you take my nose and punch it four or five times and break it, that's kind of what it looked like. Not really flat, but it, it still had a point to it, but you, it was you know smushed down a little bit and slightly predominant. And the uh, the second one that I saw, uh, I've actually I found a picture on the internet that is almost identical, besides the the hair color, to what the face looked like. And I can send that to y'all if I need to. I got it saved on my phone. Yeah, so we'd love to see it. Um, so this one that had the nose kind of poking out, uh, maybe I missed it. Did you say you could also see some of the um, the face? And if so, what color was the face? Uh, I, I really didn't, I didn't really get a good look at the face. Of course, that, that encounter was probably the, one of the scariest that I've, I've been in, in touch with. But, um, if I remember correctly, the face had more of a, of like a, the bits and pieces that I did see, I feel like it had more of a charcoal tint to it. Like a like an ashy color, but just just a little bit dark. It's like when you know you start your barbecue grill and you and you light it and you let it set for four or five minutes and it's starting to burn down a little bit. It's that that color. It's kind of what it seemed like. If I'm okay. of course that was a long time ago, you know. Right. I know. I was, that's interesting. But but yeah, there you know there was there was a lot of stuff that happened at that property. Of course, I haven't been out there in probably two years, but there was a lot of stuff that happened out there that I'm sure I'm not even remembering right now that, that were so, uh, that stuck with me. And of course there's, there's, there's another one I can relay real quick. Um, at that house, if you come out of the back door and you walk out, they had a wraparound porch. And like I said, it's surrounded by woods. And, uh, if you walk out the back door, and you look directly to your left, there's a blackberry patch. I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's probably four and a half, five foot tall. In some parts, it's, it's taller than that. But <clears throat> I walked out there one morning. It was cold, real cold. And the vines had all died down, you know. And I, 
I meandered my way through there. I was actually going to the shop. It had just been built. And uh, I saw this, this, this patch. It looked like it had been pushed over. So I, I walked over there to it. And I, uh, I kind of stood where it, you know, where it had been pushed over. And I looked back at the house. I mean, and where I was standing, and, of course, there was a bunch of limbs that hung over right there in the middle of it. But from where I was standing, I could see that house perfectly clear. And I, I kept thinking to myself, you know, during the, the, the summer months or whenever the black bears come in the, in the bloom, this, you know, this patch is real thick and it's quite a bit taller than I am. And uh, I kept thinking to myself, I wonder if they were standing right here at some point just watching us. And I, that, I think that bothered me more than anything. It's the fact that, you know, when they can see you but you can't see them, that's, that's what will get to you. 100% all the way. Yeah. And with all your encounters, um, they were all in places where uh, there were, like you said, lots of water and lots of lots of animals, in particular deer, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every, every place that I've seen them, um, there's been an abundance of, uh, of wild game. I mean, predominantly deer. Some hogs. Um, you know, uh, I've heard people tell me that they'll, uh, they'll climb trees and pull baby squirrels out of the nest and so on and so forth. I don't know if that's true. And I've never seen them do it. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the researchers that I'm, I'm real good friends with, I won't say his name, but he's actually told me that he's, he's, he's caught one up in a tree, pulling squirrels out of the nest and knocking them down and running down there and grabbing them. And uh, he told me not too long ago, actually, that if you walk in a, a patch of woods and you see all the uh, all the nests on the outside, like the skinnier limbs that you know can't hold a lot of weight, mm-hmm. that you got a pretty good chance there's a they're in that area. Mm-hmm. Fellas, I hate to say this, but we're running out of time. <laughs> I always hate to say that when we're doing this uh, because it's usually very interesting, Blake. Very fascinating stuff. Uh, any final questions, fellas? Uh, yeah, I just have one, um, or not, not actually not a question, but just a, a comment on what you were just talking about with squirrels. And Will, you can maybe briefly comment on this as well. And and Blake, I think you said pretty much, or Will said that they're pretty much hunting all the time. And I think that we think of them a lot of times as hunting mainly deer, but pretty much when they're hungry and they need a certain amount of calories, they will pretty much eat anything that any any live animal basically that they can catch including fish and like you just said hogs and of course deer and um other others as well so very interesting you know and blake i just want to comment uh that friend of yours that said that if you see a bunch of now if i understand correctly you said you see a bunch of limbs on the ground where these things have broken them while they're climbing. Is that kind of accurate, what he said? Well, well, no, really really what I meant was if, if you walk, like, a, like I said, if you walk into like a, a big area of timber um, and you see all the, the squirrel nests, I mean, they're, they're hard to miss. But if you see them out on the skinnier limbs where I, they can't hold a lot of weight, of course, we all know that these things can get real heavy. Um, but if you see them pushed out on the outer edges of the of the tree limbs, that usually means that you've got these things in the area. Of course, like I said, I don't know if that's true or not because I haven't really put a lot of paid a lot of attention to it. But I mean, it does make sense. Yeah. Okay. So he's go yeah. Ahead, go Tom. ahead. Well. Well, I was just going to say, so what he's saying then is the squirrels are reacting to these things being in the area. They're just trying to build their nest out of reach, so to speak. Exactly. That's that's what I got. Out okay. Gotcha. Well, okay. Blake, do you have any final thoughts or questions? Uh, no. <laughs> I've, I've had a great time, guys. <laughs> well, listen, keep in touch with us. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, and especially, you know, the part of the country you're in, we just interviewed um pamela pierce who's the daughter of charles pierce who created the legend of boggy creek and uh, we're going to have that of course by the time 
this show airs, that one will already been out. So <laughs> we're we're actually doing some interviews with a number of people from that part of the country, folks. So um, and I I just think a lot of it hasn't been talked about, you know, on on larger forums. So it's pretty interesting, very interesting, Blake. Thanks for coming on. No problem. Well, I enjoy it, guys. Yeah, like I said, keep yeah. Thanks a bunch, uh, Blake. You know. Yeah. All right, fellas. Well, that wraps up this segment. Uh, we're going to take a short break and stay tuned for the uh, Q and A segment. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.